Aloha, Hawaii, and welcome to Hawaii, the state of clean energy. I'm your host, Mitch Ewan, and our underwriter is the Hawaii Energy Policy Forum, and that's a program of the Hawaii Natural Energy Institute, HNEI. I'm very pleased to welcome our guest again, Toby Kincaid, a deep thinker, an inventor, an author, and most recently the publisher of Green Hydrogen Today mag magazine, and my friend for the last 30 years, and he always bails me out by coming on my show at almost zero notice. So thank you very much, Toby, for stepping up to the plate. My today pleasure. We're, uh, yeah, okay. So today we're going to discuss electric vehicle charging scenarios in Hawaii, navigating a changing landscape, because it's continually changing, and it's change today, but you'll have to listen to the show and we'll tell you what the change was. So Toby, welcome back to the show. Aloha, Commander. Thank you for having me. Great to be with you. <laughs> so let's get the uh, second, I guess the first slide up. Okay. So I have a question for you. So it's complicated. <laughs> yes. So in, so in simple <laughs> sailor's language, because I'm a sailor, uh, lead us through the different types of electric vehicle chargers and their power requirements. Toby, like give us the, the bottom line here, an idiot's guide to it. Well, uh, it's all about turning renewable energy into spinning wheels. So how do we get the sun into your wheel well and turn those wheels? That's the real question. And in when we talk about battery charging for battery electric vehicles, there are good points and tough points. The good point is that the, these cars are available. And so there's a push by the government and other interests to put in the appropriate charging infrastructure to do that. But there are a little bit, uh, there, there's some challenges here in that idea. So we'd like to kind of frame it and then lead to what HECO is now doing. They put out a new schedule to in, uh, encourage uh, people putting in uh, DC fast charge or level two chargers. So we'll get to that. But first, on that uh, little sketch, I'd like to kind of show the guy freaking out because he's looking at his bill and money's flying everywhere. And really, when it comes down to, to charging batteries, of course, the electricity you use is the important thing. And you're in Hawaii, you're in the middle of the ocean, you're 2,300 miles from any major land area. Mm -hmm. So, you know, on the mainland, if we have trouble, we can just wheel energy from another grid. But you don't have that option on the islands. And so it's it's really, I take my hat off to HECO for even keeping the grid going because in the salt water and in all of the temperature and humidity, very right. difficult to do. So hats off to that. So when we look at the electric bill, uh, you're really charged down two ways. First is the, the load. So that's the maximum over about a 15 minute period that you draw in any billing period, usually monthly. So if you have a party during the weekend and you're cooking all weekend using a lot of power, in the rest of the month, you're not using power. You're still going to be charged for that peak high water point of your demand. That's called the demand charge. And it's usually charged by kilowatt. So it's by power. Now, then you pay for the electricity. And that's by energy. That's kilowatt hour. And it's some fee for that. So they put those together. And that's just the normal uh, billing method of utilities. Well, the challenge becomes if you want to charge battery electric vehicles, you often use a lot of power. So back on that chart, if we look down, there's really three choices. You have level one, level two, and then level three is called DC fast charge. And what we're doing is they're building up as uh, very, more and more power in these dispensers to push the electricity into the battery faster and faster. Now, batteries don't necessarily like that, but we'll get to that. So on that sketch, you can see level one has a power rating of about 2.5 kilowatts or less. And I drew a little house on the bottom and a line going down just to kind of give a, a little context of what power we're talking about. So level one just uses the normal, out, the normal socket, 120 volts. And uh, you can see it's, it takes about a half of a house. A normal house is about five kilowatts if you turn everything mm -hmm. on. So uh, level one is uh, fairly slow. It takes a big battery, depends on the battery, but uh, around 12 hours to charge that. But it's done efficiently and, and uh, that's very useful for people who have the ability to put that in. Right. Then we go to level two 
And level two charger is an attempt to put more juice in. And uh, this is usually the circuit that you have for your washer and dryer. It's a 240 volt uh, service. So if you put that in, the power rating is about 7.5 or seven kilowatts generally. Some a little less, some a little bit more, but usually about seven. So you could see you should expect about three times faster charging. And in fact, we see that. We, that would charge your big battery in maybe four hours. Right. So then we get to the third option, which is DC fast charge. And now you can see that uh, DC fast charge has had a range. It usually has been over the last five or six years around 50 kilowatts for a dispenser. So that's about 10 houses worth of power to service that vehicle. But right. now the big push is to go for these really powerful 350 kilowatt uh, dispensers, and that'll push the power in much faster, although the, it's often the least efficient way. Batteries don't really like to be pushed, but uh, we're humans and we're their overlords and we say, do it. So we, we push the batteries. But the trade-off is, the challenge is, you're talking about 70 houses worth of power Everything turned on. If you get that visual, you know, just to service one DC fast charge at that 350 kilowatts. That's so, a whole neighbor. That's a whole neighborhood. It really is. It, it's it's a lot of power. And for the main lenders, that's not such a big. Well, it is an issue for the grid in many outlying areas because they're not set up to handle that capacity. But right. you you uh, we can manage it because we have a, a Western grid that allows us to wheel back and forth. Uh, you don't really have that option. Every island is independent. And so uh, uh, the challenge is, how do you satisfy customers' needs for a fast charge, uh, but not brown out your grid in doing it? So a fast charge is like if you drive your car up to the North Shore to go surfing, and you didn't have a chance to charge it at home, and it's only half full, and you get up there, and you say, oh, my God, I've only got 10% left. How am I going to get home? I, I know I don't want to have to have a tow truck or an Uber. So you're looking around for that fast charger. Absolutely. And, and you've hit on kind of the biggest uh, concern that consumers indicate, and that's range anxiety. Because right. there's a gas station on every corner, but not a fast charger or even level two charging. So uh, that's a challenge for an, an island-based grid. So... Um, uh, maybe if we go to the second slide, I'll, I'll continue on that, uh, the level one, level two, level three. Sure. So what you see in the in um, in this chart is is part of the problem. If you if you uh, at the top, you see kind of what we're trying to do in the traditional sense, use as much renewables on the grid. But as we talked about uh, earlier, uh, the the capacity factor is how how often is the vehicle actually plugged in? because renewable energy is a real time proposition. You either use it or you lose it. So right. this is very challenging for the grid operators because it's unscheduled. They don't know when you're going to fast charge. And I can tell you a lot of the independent system operators, the discussion on the mainland is how are we gonna balance all of this? We're putting on renewables, but we have to balance the load and the supply. So if the load goes up, the supply has to go up to meet it. If the load goes down, the supply has to be curtailed back Otherwise, you over-energize the grid, and, and that causes some arc flash, which would be dangerous. So the grid operators are excellent. They know what they're doing, but uh, th this is a challenge. And if they have to curtail it, uh, we're wasting renewable energy, and that's not the objective. We want to use as much renewable energy as possible. Exactly, exactly. And uh, that curtailed energy is a big number. Uh, you know, in, in the Pacific Northwest, we have something like 16 terawatt hours a year of of renewable energy that's not usable. They have to turn it off. And as you point out, after you build a facility, turning it off is not the point. So yeah, I, it's, a, it's a real uh, tough challenge. Now, I rarely have a chance to praise utilities, but I'm gonna praise them when they, when they deserve it. And what HECO has done is uh, come up with this schedule called EVJ. And what they've done is really progressive. I mean, this is a really aggressive idea. And what they're trying to do is promote people putting in chargers at their facility, their apartment building, the hotel, or wherever, uh, the strip mall, wherever you want to put some chargers in a, in a parking lot. Now, their schedule is amazing. And I'll, and I'll give you a kind of a reference to the top of that sketch. 
the reason we really don't see 350 kilowatt chargers on Oahu or any other island is that's a lot of juice. That's a lot of power. <laughs> and uh, in a, on yeah. another sketch, I'll show you a calculation where if you had a thousand vehicles charging at 350 kilowatts, that's 350 megawatts. And so a thousand cars would, at that rate would draw about a third of your grid. So that's not practical. That's not going to happen. So what Kiko did is they realized the big issue is demand charge. So if, for example, if I wanted to put in a 350 kilowatt fast charger, the demand fee would be, used to be about $24 of the commercial schedule per kilowatt. So 350 times 24, what's 8,000, 8,400 dollars, something like that. That's per month. I'd pay for one dispenser before I pay for the station or the electricity. It's very tough. So obviously, Hiko understands what they're doing because they said, okay, look, we're going to put a schedule together from uh, for midday from 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. And we're only going to charge you $2 per kilowatt for the demand charge. So in, in that case, so instead of $8,400, you're only going to pay about $700. That's a I'll much more manageable mind. figure. I checked your math, by the way. You're right on. No, good. <laughs> Very important. <laughs> Very so, good. It, it, so what they've done is they've made that demand charge low enough to be practical. Very, very good policy. And they reduced the electricity cost during that nine to five to 3.85 cents per kilo, three and a half, three, almost a little under four cents per kilowatt hour. When is the last time Hawaii ever saw that kind of rate? You know, I'm paying, I'm paying 50 cents a kilowatt hour on my hydrogen station on the big island. I mean, uh, wow. Yeah. That's, makes that's a big difference. Incredible, yeah. And so by doing this, I, I really think you should get an award for it. Kiko, you did good because you're you're moving the ball forward. You're looking at the private sector and saying, how can we help you install? Now, if you draw before 9 a.m. or after 5 p.m., that's kind of on and off peak uh, as they, they differentiate between the midday, then you're, the rate goes up to about 12 cents, but still very good. And then there's a little bit of a fine tuning with their power factor, which really relates to how easily the grid can deliver the power that you need. So there might be a little of adjustment and they have a, in the fine, fine print, they'll add another 10 cents, I believe for that adjustment. The adjustment won't be very much, so five, 10% typically. So for the most part, you've got great rates for now trying to facilitate getting people to plug in and charge. So, so like if you go, I tip my hat. So if you own a strip mall or you know a mall, yeah, a strip mall, yeah, and sorry you have electric vehicle Small charging mall. stations, you know, like they have in front of the grocery stores and places like that. So right. this could really help that out a lot for that business owner because you know the difference between paying three or four cents a kilowatt hour and fifty cents a kilowatt hour is tremendous. But also people are attracted by those quote free chargers. And if you can get yes. it, for, I mean, the business guy can still attract customers to a store and uh, they're charging the vehicle while they're buying stuff and it's only three or four cents a kilowatt hour. That's that's a heck of a good deal for the business owner. Amazing. Yeah, very much so. And then when you add on top of that, under the recent Inflation Reduction Act, now they are allowing any uh, what they call EVSE, electric vehicle supply equipment. So that could be level one, level two, could be DC fast yeah. charge, it could be hydrogen fuel cells. Under the language of the IRA, this Inflation Reduction Act, uh, you're also qualified for a 30% uh, tax credit off the top. So those things together, coupled with HECO's new EVJ schedule, is really very progressive in, in, in trying to get uh, charging infrastructure on the island and, and up and running. So uh, gotta, very interesting. But you got to figure it out. Like, you know, yes. it, and, and that's what we're trying to do on this show, you know, like at least introduce people to the, the problem and how to figure it all out so they can like uh, do models and find out when's the best time to charge and when's the best time not to charge. Um, that's right. So that's, that's what we're trying to do is de decomplicate it, make it sailor Sailor uh, friendly, <laughs> absolutely. Let's, and let's go on and, to the. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Oh no, no. Uh, maybe we'll just jump to the third slide, and we'll we'll just keep going on yeah. uh, on the uh, related to uh, what's what's involved. So, now, what are the charging levels? How about yeah? So here we've things? got one 
level one, level two, and level three. And I kind of rewrote and, and tried to draw some of the plugs so you can yeah. see another challenge is format. You, you know, when they're you not all it, the same. They're not all the same. No, they're not all the same. And in fact, I've got a little bit of a funny story about that, but I'll I'll see if we can fit it in. But uh, when you look at level one, that's 120 volts. You're just going to plug it into your wall, and every EV comes with a little a, a, a little pack. And and actually, for level one and level two, the um, the rectifier, the thing that changes the AC to the DC in the battery, that's in the car. So. Okay. You could just plug in and actually those little level one and even level two chargers, the dispensers are don't don't actually do any charging. They're just basically a fancy light switch and it turns on the juice and then the car can deal with that. Now that's different when you get to DC fast charge. That's where uh, you have to have DC high voltage, usually over 600 volts pushing into the car. But right. it, it, it it's kind of interesting at level one. You're, you know, we're dealing with that power at two and a half, pretty manageable. When you get to level two, there is a plug called a J1772. I don't know why they call it that. Not a marketing uh, brilliance in my view, but it's a J1772. <laughs> and that is kind of universal up to level two charging. So every car is going to be able to take that uh, plug format. Now, when we get to DC fast charge, now it gets even more uh, a little complicated because now you have different formats. So we've really kind of uh, narrowed it down to basically three. You have a Chatamo plug, and those are usually for the Japanese manufacturers or Asian manufacturers. That's the standard they developed. That's a different mm -hmm. plug. Then you have CCS, which is combined charging system. And that is uh, kind of standardized. And that's mostly from the European manufacturers. That was their push. And then you have a Tesla as a third party with their own format. Now, what's really funny is CCS in America, and I wrote CCS, well, it's actually CCS1. If you go to Europe, they have a CCS2, which is not compatible. <laughs> so if you brought an EV from Europe directly to the States, you'd, you'd have trouble plugging in unless they have an adapter, which I've not heard of yet. So uh, there's, there's all these formats, and this is a little bit different and difficult. And, you know, if you look at kind of the buzz on the street and people are, are early adopters, you know, they're doing the best they can with these chargers, but you have a lot of companies that are actually running the station. So you have to have their app to, to fit. You have uh, ChargePoint, OpConnect, GreenLots, EVGo, Electrify America, which is now using EVGo. But mostly you have to kind of, if you were doing a long trip in, in, on the mainland, you'd have to have four or five apps to, to be able to accommodate everything. So, so that, that, like, by apps, you mean adapters? Well, they have an app so that you can actually uh, interface with the station. None of them have like a, a card reader for your credit card or debit card. Yeah. They they don't do that. For some reason, that the owner operators, or at least the back office, the one that, that does the charging in terms of charging your wallet and allowing you access to the charge, that's that's really been a little bit of a, of a mess. Now, in Europe, they said, look, Years ago, maybe five, six years ago, they said, look, we're going to we're going to make sure that every car that's a battery EV can charge at any station. So right. they standardized CCS, well, CCS2 in the European style. And they said to Tesla, hey, you can put any chargers you want, but you have to have CCS2 so anybody can use it. That was a very smart idea. We didn't do that in America. The, the government doesn't have any influence really at all. It doesn't set any standards, actually, for, in terms of how how uh, any mandate to what's accessible and what is not. It's all kind of done by private interests. So it, it is a bit of a challenge. Now, uh, on the bottom of this page, I, I, I put together kind of a look at Oahu. Now, if we look at the grid on Oahu, if you turn every generator on, it's about 1.6 megawatts, uh, excuse me, 1.6 gigawatts. That's the whole grid. That's what everything on. The normal peak of the grid on Oahu is somewhere around 1.2 gigawatts. So you need 1.2 billion watts to run this island available at any particular time. So that, that then we get to this calculation on that sketch. At the bottom, I put 1,000 times a, a battery electric vehicle at 350 kilowatts. And then we get this 350 megawatt draw for only 1,000 cars at that high level. So that's right. very challenging. That's a 30-year grid. So not a practical, there's a limit then. And HECO recognizes this and said, okay, at least under our new EVJ program, they're kind of, as I read it, they're envisioning kind of level two chargers that 
that are put on. But in the EVJ schedule, they point out that we, they will install three phase if you wish it. Uh, I don't know if there's a fee for that. There usually would well, be. However, they are saying that we'll, the HECO will pay for all of the, the grid improvements if under this program. And I should also point out that there's a limit, I think, of a thousand sites that they'll allow this. So uh, between the Big Island, uh, Maui, and Oahu. And let's talk a little bit about charging uh, efficiency. Ah, yeah. Our, that's... Our, favorite, our favorite topic here. Yes. <laughs> well, it's an important one for sure. And here's the thing about batteries, you know. Now, as we know, there's two types of electric vehicles. There's the all battery style, and then there's the hydrogen fuel cell. They're both electric vehicles. The fuel cell makes the, the energy in real time from the hydrogen. And the nice right. thing about that is you can make clean hydrogen like you're doing at on the big island with your solar arrays. And so um, what what we have here is is uh, that the, the this new schedule would allow for a level two. But I would say that you could go to level three under that schedule, as long as you stay another parameter is you have to stay under 300 kilowatts. So obviously at 300, one 350 dispenser would not qualify. So one dispenser is already disqualified. But if you lower the power of those DC fast charts back to say 50 kilowatts each, then you could conceivably have six. So you're you're much faster with the DC fast charge, but you're drawing, of course, much more current. So when we talk about these batteries, what I see on the top chart is see the little 20%. Now you're yeah. told if you have a battery EV, not to discharge the battery more than 20% or or further down, and they don't want you to charge it beyond 80%. So you have kind of 20% at the top and 20% at the bottom that you're not really supposed to use. So I think in a conversation we had, it almost was like a turtle, right? You carry your you carry your house on your back. So you're right, carrying right. around a lot of, of EV weight. And that's kind of, when we look at this chart, you'll notice that the, the 20% you're starting, the efficiency is really fairly high because the battery is thirsty. But okay. as you charge like a battery, mm, and, and that's that's great, but as you start charging a battery, so increases its resistance to being charged. So it's very much like a metal spring and you're going to grab both ends and you're going to stretch and stretch. Well, it's kind of easy in the beginning, but then it really protests. And that's kind of what's happening in a battery. It's the batteries like everything slow. They prefer yeah. to charge slowly and they prefer to discharge slowly. But batteries work for humans. Humans say, hey, go fast. But they don't like it. And I, I'm not a horse whisperer or a battery whisperer, but I know enough of their language. <laughs> know that if, if you touch a battery and it's hot, it's mad. It's protesting. It's trying right. to tell you, stop. What do you, why you gave me something to drink? That's great. But now you're, you're just pouring water. In it. Stop, stop, stop. But no, we push them. So right. when you look at the battery style, you know, I, I've worked with batteries for decades and, and I have a lot of respect for batteries, but they should be used properly and not necessarily the whole load as a battery. That's very difficult because batteries don't have a lot of energy density. They have pretty good power density. You can get that short right across it and boom, you go fast, but you can't sustain it very long. So the, these are kind of the, the, the quagmire that we have to balance. So now when we look at the bottom of that sketch, you'll see that if you want more range on an EV, you have no choice but to add more battery. And that adds right. more weight, that adds rolling resistance. Now compare that to a, a fuel cell truck the largest fuel cell truck I've seen coming out of Europe has 70 kilograms of hydrogen they can store in mm -hmm. their tanks. But, um, you know, that's 150 pounds, something like that. Not very much compared to the weight of a fully loaded truck. So the, yeah. the weight difference only gets better. It doesn't actually go up if you want more range any any to any significant amount. So these are kind of the, the parameters that the, the battery guys want to do, the government wants to do, the uh, city planners want to do, and, you know, okay. And, and with this new aggressive uh, EVJ, Kiko, bravo, well done. I think you're going to see a lot of response to that because it's a great deal. Yeah, yeah especially for yeah. business. Mm -hmm. uh, fleet operators, it's, uh, it's ideal for them. So let's go on to the next slide and talk mm -hmm. about various uh, charging scenarios. You got your AD, Oh, C, great, yeah. D. Well, so where does that leave you? I, in my view, in my opinion, you've got uh, essentially four scenarios here. 
The top scenario, A, is basically business as usual. Try and put as much renewable as you can, but it's a real-time operation. If the car is plugged in and can take advantage of that renewable energy in real time, great. If it's not during the sunny hours, then you're using whatever mix the grid has. So right. the, 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 the top scenario is basically connecting directly to the grid. There's the power conditioning equipment. And, and again, the equipment is between the car or the consumer and the grid. All of that is called EVSE. And that comes up a lot because now the tax code is, is referring to this specifically. So that, that's a great progress there as well. And EVSE so, means, uh, remind us again. I'm sorry? Remind us what EVSE means. Oh, yes. Forgive me. Uh, uh, electric vehicle supply equipment. Right. So that applies to everything. It could be level one, level two, DC fast charge, and hydrogen fuel cells as well. So there's a 30% uh, tax credit available for that hardware now. And uh, that's pretty significant. Very, very helpful. Certainly before it was active, you'd have to come up with the other 30%. So that's a good, that's a good thing. So that's your first scenario. But you could see that that power demand is really tough on the grid because it's in real time. And I'd like to point out in an emergency, if a typhoon, you know, knock on wood, this doesn't happen. But if a typhoon swings around the big island or comes up underneath and, and nails Oahu, your, your grid is not very well hardened. Uh, it's going to be in, in splinters, and that means that nobody can charge at all. There's not even electricity to pump the gas. So there is a vulnerability with scenario A. Now, and another approach is a technology where they put a solar canopy on a mast, and then at, at the, you can see in scenario B, I have a car there drawn. But take the car away, and you see that kind of big plate. That's a big steel plate, and it's kind of covered with rubber, and that's a ballast mount. So the kind of cool thing about this is you don't have to, you probably don't even need a permit because you're not drilling into anything. It's removable. It installs in a day or several hours, actually, is all you need. Right. And the, the, the downside is it tends to be a little higher cost. So that's a little something that, again, that 30% might help alleviate. But the, the other issue is you're limited to level two. See, right. batteries, and th what's neat about this capacity factor is if the car isn't there, the solar energy is wasted. But in that scenario, number B, they put a battery on the masthead and to collect all the energy when you're not there and then run right. your level two charger. Right. The problem is you can't really get to DC fast charge from small batteries. It's, it's too much of a draw for them, not right. practical. Yeah. So that kind of then leads us to scenario C, which is my favorite, which is what you do on the big island by putting down electrolyzers. And now you could build all your renewables. You could overbuild your, your grid in renewables because there's somewhere for it to go. This is the brilliance of your design on the big island is, and why you, it, connecting it to the grid was such a good idea. I mean, it's a perfect teaching power plant because you're demonstrating green hydrogen, but you're also saying, hey, let's take it from the grid at night and use other people's renewable energy that's the idea. That's what you're going for, and, it, and it's a great way to go. So in scenario C, we're kind of, there's a technology being developed uh, by EV4, by Hans Vandermeer here in, in Portland, where they're putting a, a fuel cell stack, and we're going to run the DC fast charge from the fuel cell. So normally a fuel cell is in a vehicle, you know, a hydrogen fuel cell vehicle, that's right. a fuel cell, but we're going to put it on the station as well, because now we can take your hydrogen run the fuel cell, do DC fast charge at any level that you want to design it for. And there's no grid impact because the, yeah. the grid doesn't see the fuel cells. They only see the electrolyzer and that's a scheduled load. And it's much yeah. smaller than the fuel cell. So from, from, for my money, I say go with option C. And then just to finish it, option D is option C without the grid. If you just right. wanted to run solar and maybe some wind at night, if, if, if a smaller wind perhaps, because large wind isn't isn't terribly popular but the smaller wind would probably work uh, very well in terms of keeping your electrolyzer going and producing uh, hydrogen that you then use for dc fast charge and yeah. i love that idea because you're kind of putting in half the infrastructure you need for when you do dispense the hydrogen from those sites you've already got the electrolyzer and the storage and all the filters and dryers and everything is there so you could just add dispensers and and uh, a little more uh, compression and you're ready to go so the future is definitely going to be fuel cells because of the advantages, fast fueling, right. long range, n n very little rare earths, if any, depending on how what technology you choose. 
that's very scalable. Plus you can take all of the solar and wind that you have and turn it into energy where none of it is curtailed. That's I think I the think. future for Oahu and, and Hawaii. I, I totally agree. So uh, let's go on to the next slide. We're running out of time. We're on the oh. down slope here, which is good. So uh, oh. let's talk about charging made simple. Yeah, this one, you know, that's the thing, you know, people have, uh, if you monitor it, and I try to, you hear people complaining that all oh, these different standards and all oh, the things doesn't, this one's not working, and you get all this trouble. So I'd like to say if we were doing DC far, fast charge, I would just slap on a QR scan code sticker and sign up with Apple Pay. And so you drive up, plug in your car, snap a picture of the code and the app goes, oh, hello, Mr. Perkins, I see you'd like a DC fast charge. So you commence, yes, and you're done. So right. I think that's the way to go, and and but all of these other interests, the green lots and the 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 other companies that I mentioned, they have a business model and they have good apps and they're and they're uh, there to manage the money to authorize the charge, so uh, it it'll grow. So yeah. at the start, we uh, we really named our uh, our show well by saying uh, navigating a changing landscape because hot off the press today. The P, you know, it was announced that the PUC is adopting this time uh, another kind of. I'm not sure what the details are, but time of use rates for the Heco companies. So it's kind of like the, uh, you know, your EJ, uh, your uh, EVJ uh, um, uh, 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 billing code. Uh, right. But they just come up today, so we'll get a chance to do this show again, Toby, and uh, and update it as we go along, so that people have the latest the latest scoop here. I, I so, love it. And, and, and the uh, the other thing on that last slide I would just mention is I love the idea of someone just saying, "Hey, for ten bucks you get a hundred miles in about ten minutes." Yeah. Now yeah, that right. would take quite a DC fast charge. You'd have to get up to around one hundred and fifty kilowatts to do that. But if we use the system that you're doing on the Big Island, uh, that's not a problem. So yeah. I I think uh, some creative marketing make it easy for the customer to interface, and uh, I think that's a winning combination. Yeah, you know, I think uh, going forward, uh, the, the reason it's going to change is as we get uh, familiar with the system, we can figure out better ways to do things. So all of this is is uh, based on, oh, maybe it would work better if we do it this way. And sure enough, it does. So we're going to change the rules to make it easier for everybody. So exactly. That, that, that's the really process. Good way to go. Yeah, yeah, that's a good process. Exactly. So, um, so I just want to call up the next slide, which is... Uh, a little bit of uh, acknowledgement to you. Oh, well, thank you. I'd invite everyone to go to their uh, Apple App Store or Google Play and uh, we develop an app called Green Hydrogen Today. It's it's magazine. It's it's in the format of a magazine, but the app functions are really getting exciting because we're adding every, it's quarterly, and every issue we're adding more companies in the Green Hydrogen directory and this would allow you to find electrolyzer companies, fuel cell companies, engineering companies, finance companies, storage companies. So all of this is is uh, just to, to increase the industry and uh, happily uh, it's growing. And so I'm, I'm happy to report we're still here. Yeah. No, it's <laughs> a great, we'll it's a great magazine, Toby. So, so that's it. Uh, we're gonna have to leave it there. We're just, we just ran out of time. So thank you so much, Toby. Oh. You've been watching Hawaii, the state of clean energy on Think Tech Hawaii. And Today we've been talking to Toby Kincaid, my, my friend, author, publisher, and deep thinker about EV charging in Hawaii. And stand by, it's going to change as it did today. So thanks for participating, to Toby. And uh, thanks to our, our viewers for turning, uh, tuning in. So I'm Mitch Ewan. We'll be back in two weeks with another edition of Hawaii, the state of clean energy. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii.
If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.